for the last four lessons, we have dealt with four statements. Number one, people are God's idea. Number two, God wills only good for people. Number three, God is not mad at people. And number four, God is spirit, people are his flesh. Now we have wrapped up this quarter emphasizing these four facts which I consider summarize the greatest embodiment of truth that has affected my life and ministry to the world during the past 40 years in over 70 countries. I know of no way to summarize the essence of what I'm all about and what I believe Christians ought to be about than those four sentences. People are God's idea. God wants only good for people. God is not mad at people. God is spirit. People are his flesh. I don't know how those statements strike you, but I pray that everybody that has participated in this class and who participates by video, that those four statements will become cardinal milestones of understanding in your lives. I know of nothing more vital. Now today we're talking about God is spirit, people are his flesh. I'm going to read some verses to you that I feel are very, very vital from Paul. <clears throat> he is before all things and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. You believe that? And uh, did I tell you it's in Colossians chapter 1? It pleased the Father that in him, in Jesus, should all fullness dwell. Listen to verse 20. Having made peace. Now that's what the world needs. They can never be hooked up with God without peace. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. Go down to verse 21. You that were sometimes alienated. Now are you hearing me? Hear these words alienated. Peace. Alienated. Peace. Brought you back. Keep the picture. In the beginning, God wanted to be with people. Told Moses, build a house where I can dwell among the people. God's wanting to live in people. Never give up on his dream. Never change. You remember the other four, the four, other four statements that I made to summarize this? God had a dream and I do too. God's dream concerned the good of people. Mine does too. God never gave up on his dream. I won't either. God's dream worked. Look at me. I'm the proof. My dream works too. There is nothing as vital to the formation of an attitude that will, that will create a successful ministry as those four statements that I've given to you in two different ways. The idea, understanding that God's idea can be planted in you and it's to live in people. Now, that's why I, I, I hesitate, I diverted a little bit to talk. You who were sometimes alienated, sin alienated us, separated us, cut us off, from communion with God where we, couldn't, where we couldn't be the vessel or the instrument or the expression of God through which he could do his thing. Sin alienated us. 
you who were alienated, and enemies in your mind. See, when people get away from God, they're given up to reprobate man, do the things that are not convenient, miss everything that God has for them. Alienated and enemies in their mind, thinking to connive their own ways instead of God ways, God's ways, dreaming up all sort of distorted ideas and methods and procedures, not having God's ideas and methods and procedures, you with me? Alienated, enemies in your mind. Now, he's reconciled. <clears throat> That's a beautiful word. He didn't say you reconcile yourself to God, or you thought up an idea to get yourself reconciled to God, or even that you wanted to be reconciled to God. You didn't even give two hoots about it. It was his dream. You didn't want to be close to God. God wanted to be close to you. Which means he thinks more of you than you do of him. He thinks more of people than people do of him. People ignore him. He doesn't ignore people. People don't want to be around him. He wants to be around people. He's love. You getting it? You were alienated, were an enemy, did think contrary, but now he has reconciled you to God. Now that's the idea we're studying. God is spirit. People are his flesh. Without flesh, God's spirit has no expression in this world. It's a world of people. People are God's idea. You know, a lot of spiritual, a lot of super spiritual people have never understood that flesh and blood, human persons, walking and thinking and, 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 and messing up life are God's idea. God thought them up. And since God's pretty smart, if one idea don't work, he'll have another one. He don't quit. So here we are. Statement number four, which is what this lesson's all about. God's dream works. Look at me. I am the proof. And my dream works too because I hook up with his dream and never quit on people till even the mean ones turn out to be nice ones. If we can't get them one way, we'll come another way. If one sermon don't get them, we'll get another sermon. If one love deed won't get them, we'll have another love deed. We won't quit till we get um, We won't quit. That's love. That's ministry. Boy, say wow. 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 Winning our world. Amen. Reconcile in the body of his flesh through death to present you, verse 22, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now, if we can get that across to people, God did all that. Jesus paid for all of that. We can receive all of that without that ever having been our drive or our dream or our desire or our idea or without us ever paying anything for it, doing anything that'll get it, managing to be able to put up any money or actions of kindness, or good works, or anything to get it, God did it on his own. Not because we was helping or wanted it, but despite the fact that we didn't want it and didn't care about it, God did it, and here we are, hallelujah, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. See, that's the secret of all of it. We hear it. The gospel is our hope. It gives us the image, the idea, the fascination, the dream, the concept, the focus of what God has in mind for us. The gospel does that. Shows us what Jesus paid to restore us to God so we could be one with God. And so he's done it all to present us holy. Say, I'm holy. Unblameable, say I'm unblameable. Irre unreprovable, I'm unreprovable. 
That's pretty powerful. Friends, that's the gospel. Now, if we don't believe in that, we've got no business preaching. If we don't believe in that, we have no business going and talking to people about the Lord. Because if we don't believe in that, we will find a way to expose them to the contagious disease that we emit. The disease of guilt, of sin consciousness, of unholiness, of unworthiness, of... Uh, of uh, of not believing in ourselves, of despondency, of fear, of cowering before God. We'll expose that to people of unbelief. We'll expose to them the ideas that we embody It'll catch. It's contagious. They'll get like us if we don't believe this. We'll cause people to be afraid. You see lots of preachers that preach to people. And the people who run with them are just as spooky as the preacher is. Faithless, often, fearful, feeling themselves far from God unworthy to approach God, careful around God, afraid of God, a guilt complex. Now listen, the world don't need none of that. The world has got problems. They're scared. They're lonely. They're breaking apart. They're diseased. They're insecure. They're angry. They're guilt-ridden. They're self-conscious. They're afraid. They don't need our problems. They got enough of their own. We're supposed to bring them help and peace and deliverance and salvation and righteousness and holiness and faith, and confidence, and happiness, and fulfillment, and success, and prosperity, and self-esteem, and, and, and joy, and blo a blossoming life, and hope. That's what we're to give to people. That's what God wants to give to people. God, last week, God is not mad at people. Only the preachers are mad at them. And only the self-righteous saints are mad at them. God isn't. They're wasting their time. If God would be mad at people because of, their, because of the way they live, I don't know what he might have done. I guess he'd have, uh, I don't know, got rid of this thing instead of saving it. But God just believes in people. If we don't believe in people, we won't help people. My sister came up. I can tell this on her because if she was here, she'd smile. Sister Gillock, pastor in Texas. Every time she'd come up to visit us, she would just, she was just in agony. And she was concerned bless her heart, about the people that weren't living all she was preaching. And I'll tell you, she was just so frustrated about this. Well, you know me, I wanted to help my sister. I wanted her to feel happy. I didn't like to see her down all the time. Is anything wrong with that? I'm not trying to sweep it under the rug. I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to cover up sin. But I'm saying if there's not an attitude, that's what this quarter has been about, the whole thing. If there's not an attitude, 
of believing in people and knowing that people can become what God has for them to be. If there's not a positive attitude about it, we're a drag on society. And we get up and we drag the people down. And people don't want to listen to us. And I told her one day, just, now excuse me, I'm putting this on the video and on the tape. If this is a little extreme, forgive me, I'm trying to make a point. I told her, I said, Daisy, <laughs> if the people lived everything you preached to them last Sunday, they wouldn't need you this next Sunday. <laughs> they could do without you. Now, I know that, that uh, you could really cut me down on that. But can't you go past the shock and see the point? The point is, be happy. Be a minister of joy and of life and of peace. And if they didn't live it, don't condemn them and send them to hell and act like you're tickled they burn hot. But go back with another message and lift them again next week. And they'll grow in grace. And that's why they'll overcome. But if you get up and browbeat them and hit them on the head every week, they won't grow nor overcome. They'll just dodge and get discouraged and backslide because you added to them more problems than they already had. I'm talking about attitude in ministry. And I'm not talking about ministry just in the pulpit. I'm talking about ministry as a plumber, as a carpenter, as a painter, as a, as a builder, as an office person. We are all ministers. And the attitude of a winner must possess us or we'll be a nuisance to people instead of a blessing to people. Pick people up. Don't knock them down when they make a mistake. I don't want to overemphasize that, but I, I consider the most vital point of all that I've taught you this, this quarter. God is spirit. People are his flesh. God has no expression in this world except through people imperfect as we are. Jesus paid for our sins, and while we overcome and grow, let's not kill each other because we make a mistake. Let's support each other and keep reminding each other of the love of God and His grace and His full payment for our wrongs so that we'll keep trying. Does that help you? Yeah, that's worth clapping on. Hallelujah. And I don't, I don't want you to feel that I'm, I'm covering sin or trying to, trying to say sin's not important. I'm, try, I'm saying we need good news messengers that will speak for God, not in Old Testament language, but God, who got tired of that kind of stuff himself and said, I've got to make a better way. And he gave us a better covenant and gave Jesus perfect blood, died for the sins of the world. And says, now go report that. Tell the world that. So that people can understand a price is paid for everybody. Everybody can be saved and become the righteousness of God if they'll believe it and stay rooted and grounded in that faith. Hallelujah. And not moved from the hope of the gospel whereof I, Paul, am a minister. Say, I'm a minister of the hope of the gospel. That's what I minister. Hope through the gospel. I'm not a minister to condemn everybody that hasn't yet lived up to the gospel. I'm a minister of the hope of the gospel. I'm preaching instead of teaching. 
reconcile. Yet you now has he reconciled to present, pre to present you wholly unblameable, unreprovable. I am a God, made a minister of the gospel according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. What is this hope of the gospel? Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest, shown out in the open, demonstrated how. It's made manifest to the people of God to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this, minist of this mystery among the people, which is Christ in you the hope of glory. God is spirit. People are his flesh. Christ, whom we preach, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. Whereunto I labor, striving according to his working, which works in me. He is working in me. He is spirit. I am his flesh. He is working in me. Reconciling people. 2 Corinthians 5, he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Reconcile, restore to friendship or harmony, to settle all the differences to restore to peace our favor, to reunite, to harmonize. Isn't it wonderful when you get people harmonized with God through Jesus? That's the hope of the gospel. We keep giving them hope, keep giving what the gospel is, they'll, they'll harmonize. Hallelujah. You believe it? To comprehend all of that, we have to understand gospel. Gospel. Never forget this. We'll probably be dealing with it a little bit more when we go into the next quarter, but gospel is creation, restoration, and now. Put it this way. Write it this way. Gospel is Adam I like to say Adam and Eve. Adam, Jesus, me. Write down those three words. Adam and Eve, Jesus, me. Gospel. God did it once in Adam. He wanted the world to see. I mean, he, he, he wanted to reproduce himself, that was his dream, to have fellowship with a being like him. You can't have fellowship with someone lower than you or above you. Equality. Adam is his own image. Adam. But a prerequisite, it had to be mutual trust. I'll trust you, you trust me. I believe in you, you believe in me. God said that, that's, that's the deal. He never changes on his ideas. Right today, the sum and substance, of the totality of God's deal with us is, I believe in you, believe in me. I trust you, trust me. Adam, didn't, Adam and Eve didn't trust him. Satan lied. They believed the lie more than what God said. Broke the trust. Broke the harmony. Alienated them from God because God cannot fellowship sin. But God never gave up. He did it again in Jesus. Said, I'll do it again. Hallelujah. Say, I'll do it again. That's what God says. And he did it again. And he created another human person, Jesus. This time, created him 
by the miraculous implantation of the seed of God in the womb of a virgin. And uh, we know in science, we have two medical doctors in here who will confirm this uh, right today. We know in science that that seed, that embryo, that, 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 that develops, that, that, that beautiful little thing that takes form in the womb, there is never any interchange of blood between the blood of that little being and the blood of the mother. No. It's, it creates its own blood. And it's an individual. Separate. Individual. In the likeness of its parent, but private, individual, different blood, different fingerprints, everything different. Jesus was that, his blood. No, was not, was not from, his, his existence was not from the seed of a man, but the seed of God. Blood, not from the seed of the man or any interchange from the Virgin Mary, its own blood, the seed of God, perfect, pure, blood divine the Lamb of God, from the foundation of the world, pre-planning, seeing our messing up, God not giving up. Hallelujah. And uh, so he did it again. Became a full man. Grew in stature and wisdom, the knowledge of God, the grace of God. Studied the scriptures like you and I do. Discovered who he was in the scriptures, just like you and I discover who we are in the scriptures. No different. Then was led out in the wilderness to be tempted of Satan, like you and I are tempted of Satan. Like Adam and Eve were tempted of Satan. Satan said, I'll get this one too. I'm sorry, Satan said that. You hear me? Yeah, yeah, sound like say it, yeah. Are you, are you with me? Satan said, I'll get this one too. I got the first one, I'll get this one. Satan, one thing, jealous of God, could not bear for God to reproduce himself. That's the whole problem. You ever think about it like that? That was his drive. Adam and Eve created of God in his own image that God would walk and talk with, fellowship, friendship. And Satan had a fit, said, I got to stop it. I got to stop it. And he was very subtle, and he did. He pulled the one idea, you know, don't trust God. Don't believe what God said. So when Jesus came, created of God, again, God saying, I'm going to express myself I'm going to live. I'm going to make a creation on this earth. I've designed it. I'm going to live. The world's going to see what I'm like in human flesh. That's what they see when they see us. God is spirit. We are his flesh. He did it again in Jesus. Jesus born, grew up, studied, found himself in the scriptures, then was led out to be tempted of Satan. And Satan comes to him three times with very basic temptations that I won't go into, but each one of them, Jesus reacted the opposite of what Adam and Eve reacted in the garden. They said, oh, is that true? You're giving me more news? I know God said it this way. Oh, is it a different way? Okay. And that's the subtle problem that destroys people to this day came to Jesus, contradicted God's word with the temptation. Jesus said, wait a minute. That's not what God said. And he quoted God, what God said. Came back again, did it again. Wait a minute. That's not what God said. Left, came back again. Third time, Jesus, wait a minute. God didn't say that. God said this. And Satan left for a season. And angels came and ministered. And God must have clapped his hands and said, I knew it would work. I knew it would work. 
And I think he claps his hands on every one of us. When we go out, we face temptation, tempted of the devil to not believe God. And we believe and come through. And God says, I knew it would work. Watch him, watch him, watch him. Yeah. No question about it. No question. About it. I love that where Paul said, God now in the Living Bible, now God can always point to us as examples of how rich He is to those who trust in Him. I love to see God sitting up there pointing at me once in a while. Say, see, He's over there in Africa now. See Him? Look, look, look at Kim. Been over there in Pakistan. Did you see Him in Pakistan? Hey, demons, watch Kim. It works. My new creation works. And what about you in Tulsa? You face the devil, and you don't yield, and you're strong in the faith. Do you ever think about God sitting up there and say, Hey, look at Pat, see? Hey, look at Doc. He made it. I told you. And Satan seething with jealousy all the time with his individual plans to bring down every one of us. He has a plan for every one of us. He has a blueprint for every one of us. He knows our weak points. And he is constantly trying to bring us down. Why? Because when we believe and are rooted in the faith, then we are the flesh through which God's Spirit does his thing in this world. And Satan don't want God people. So he has a strategy. He'll watch for your weak points. And he'll constantly try and try and try and try and never give up. Whom you resist steadfast in the faith and he flees from you and he'll come back and try it again. But that wicked one toucheth him or her not. God is spirit. We are his flesh. Are, are, are you understanding this? Do you understand what I meant? Adam, Jesus, me. Jesus came, didn't sin, in action didn't sin. There was no sin in his bloodline. There was no sin in him like there was in us. Not Jesus, born of the seed of God. Now, when we're born again of the incorruptible seed of God, the Word of God, which lives and abides forever, we're born of the same seed that Jesus was born of when we're born again. But that couldn't have happened had Jesus not paid for our new birth. He took my sins and put them away and did everything required to present me holy, and unblameable and unreprovable before God. And God made him to be sin for me that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. He paid for it. So now, since he, and then of course, as we've, you know, then he went to the cross, died as our lamb, the sacrificial offering for our lamb, died, was buried, settled with Satan, conquered him, rose from the dead with his own blood into the holy place. And the new covenant was approved. It worked. The new covenant, that blood was accepted and speaks today because it was sinless blood. Not only sinless from action and thoughts, but sinless from origin. Nothing spoiled it. Jesus, tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin. His blood, having been proven, his life having been tempted and proven, his blood, then taken into the holy place of heaven, was approved. Said, it's okay. It's okay. It'll stand. No sin exposed to everything they're exposed for. We, act, we accept that on behalf of everybody. Now, we got to get preachers busy, runners, messengers, talkers, tellers, voices, people, feet, hands, mouths, flesh. We got to get it in gear to go out and tell everybody about this good news 
and everyone that believes it will be saved. And I heard it, and I believed it, and I'm saved. So Adam, Jesus, me. That is gospel. You haven't got gospel until you have creation, the fall, restoration, and now my recreation. That's, that's the essence of uh, who we are. Now, uh, John chapter 1 said uh, he was in the world and the world was made by him. Verse 10, the world knew him not. Verse 11, he came to his own, his own received him not. Verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, daughters of God, children of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Were born of God, the incorruptible seed. You believe that? Verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. We saw God in flesh and beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, talks about the house of God, the church of the living God. Say, that's me. Say it louder. That's me. That's me. You believe that? Yes. It talks about that. And verse 16 says, without controversy, great is the mystery of God. This, this thing, you can't figure it out in human wisdom. It's a mystery. God was manifest in the flesh. Manifested in the flesh. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed in the world, received up into glory, and now come back and lives in me. Hallelujah. You believe that? That's, that's a great mystery, but that's what it's all about. That's the house of God, the church of the living God. Now look at 2 Corinthians 5. If anyone is in Christ, that one is a new creature. Old things passed away, all things become new. 18. All things are of God, who's reconciled us to himself. What did we say that means? Restored us to friendship. Hallelujah. Harmonized us with God. Say, I'm harmonized. I'm harmonized. Settle all the differences. Say, there's no difference between me and God. We're friends. We're in harmony. He's restored us to peace and favor. Say, I have peace. Say, I'm in favor. I'm, I'm restored to favor with God. That's why I have peace with God. I'm restored to his favor. I didn't do it. He did it. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? Verse 19. No, verse 18. He's reconciled us to God, to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given us, now, the ministry of reconciliation. Isn't that powerful? We're reconcilers. That's what I told my sister Daisy. Just get up there, be happy, and tell them again about the reconciliation that's wrought by Christ on our behalf. It's a powerful truth. God, verse 19, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Say, God was in Christ. And see, he was not imputing their trespasses to them and now has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. You and I are the reconcilers. I think we closed last week with those three points I gave you. Uh, let's see if I can find them right quick. We are, God's, we are God's lovers. We are God's contactors. We are God's cedars. Now he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. So now we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech people by us be reconciled by God. It's just reconciled to God. It's just like God was talking through us, telling people, be reconciled to God. Believe on Jesus Christ. Isn't that terrific? Do you think that every time you talk to people? God's talking through you. That'll jerk the slack out of you. You don't want to run around and cower. 
run around like a God person. When you talk to a sinner, he's talking to God. That's why I said on the radio, on the TV up there with Casey Treat there in Seattle, said, what do you want to say about God? And I blurted out that silly sounding line. I had never, I hadn't premeditated. I just blurted it out. I said, Casey, I just want everybody to know that if they can get to T.L. Osborne, they can get to heaven. What a thing to say. But what truth there is in that? I mean, I suppose it was a prophecy. A prophetic utterance. A wondrous utterance. That's what prof mo most prophecy is, saying things you don't know anything about. Blurting out things that's brand new. And that's what I did. You can get to T.L. Osborne, you can get to heaven. Hallelujah. And I got, to happy, I got happy thinking about what I had said. The more I thought about it, the more I believed it. And it, it put me, give me a posture in witnessing that's important. When I talk, God talks. He's willing to identify with my language. When you talk, when you witness, God is witnessing through you. Believe in your connection. Why is all that? Verse 21, because he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You doing okay? John 4, 24 says, God is a spirit. You believe that? 1 Timothy 3, 16, God was manifest in the flesh. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 6, 16, I will walk among you and I'll be... No, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 16, For you are the temple of the living God. Say, I believe that. I believe that. As God has said. Can you take this? God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God. They will be my people. When you talk, God talks. He has no flesh but yours. God is spirit. We are his flesh. Ephesians 2.22, in whom you are builded together for an habitation of God through the spirit. <laughs> That's why when I write in books and articles, I always talk about let, I appeal to unbelievers, let God come home to you. You know, we always tell people, come home to God. I think God's the one that's looking for a place to dwell. People think God's got it made with a throne of no telling what precious stones and circled by diamonds and, and, and guards and angels. That don't make God happy. God created a human person because he wanted rapport. He's got sense. He don't want to sit up there on a throne and brag and gloat. That don't make anybody happy. He's there when we need him. Is that door locked over there? It's not locked, is it? No, I thought so. He's there when we need him. But God wants a dwelling place. He wants to come home. I keep the door open. I honor him. I confess him. I practice the presence of him. Develop the awareness of him. Hello. God is spirit. We are flesh. We're builded together for an habitation of God. I love the way the Living Bible puts it. It said, we are the dwelling place of God. Say, so that's what I am. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, I don't have time. Our time is, uh, is, is gone, but I wanted to take you through the book of John, but you can do it yourself. I've written down so many scriptures I don't have time to give to you. Jesus just couldn't tell them really how it is. And there's no book like the book of John to see how he straddled the fence, how many ways he played on language to get the point across. You see, for him to say, God and me, I am God, God's in me, God's working through me. That's what finally 
Pilate wouldn't give up and he insisted and they finally clapped their hands and said, now kill him. He said enough. They finally killed him for that. Those were the meanest words anybody could say. Here we are trying to get everybody to catch on to it. See, but I tell you, when a human person got the idea that God could live in them, it was the most, it was the most sacrilegious concept that anybody could ever come up with. And that's what brought the persecution of the early church. They were out like Saul of Tarsus. The, the high priests had their reps out everywhere, hunting them up, running them down, arresting them, persecuting them, torturing them. The Living Bible says, I tortured them to make them curse Christ. The whole persecution of the church was their idea, their claim, that God has come to live in us. Jesus is in us just like before they killed him. And I'll tell you that that religious world was out to kill them for that. That is the message of the church of Jesus Christ. The ecclesia, the called out ones that are different than anybody else. God living in them as his habitation. And when people can get to us, they can get to heaven. When they can get to us, they can get to God. When they get to us, they find God. And I start to say, I wanted to take you through the book of John and show you how many times Jesus would just go through it and look at his language, but never forget the, what he was wanting to say all the time was, I'm God. God's in me. God's alive in me. God's come to you. God's talking to you. You see me, you've seen God. But how he played with the words. Because people can only take truth on the level of their hearing ability. That's all the truth you're taking today, the level of your hearing ability. But you're growing. Hallelujah. Okay. I sure hate to cut it off. Boy, there's lots of good stuff that I'd like to share with you. But I tell you, this is the most powerful thing that I know to teach. God is spirit. You and I are hip.